After all these years, Lori finally spoke, and what she finally had to say had me screaming at the television. We're going to talk about that and the other highlights of her sentencing in today's video. Hello, Sofa Squad, and welcome back to the sofa. It's still behind me with Mr. Roscoe. He's over there. He was just chicken scratching as he likes to do. Now he stopped, so we'll see what he does. And my name is Paul. Now, if you're new to the channel, hello, welcome, and well, pull up a cushion. And if you're still, you know, been hanging out here, well, I do appreciate you coming back to join me on the sofa. Now, you saw the thumbnail, you heard my intro. We are talking about it finally arrived sentencing, right? Oh my gosh, y'all. I did a post saying like, okay, look, it's going to take me a couple of days to be able to respond and make my video with my thoughts and stuff. Y'all, it was a roller coaster of emotion, right? Because in the beginning we heard victim impact statements and I'm sitting here like so happy to finally hear people get to say to Lori, but you know, to the core, you know what I mean? how they felt, you know, and she had to sit there and just listen to it and be in that moment, right? We would hope at least. But then, so it's like, yeah, I'm cheering them on. And then we get to, you know, the defense speaks and I'm like, G -g 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 -g. and then Lori speaks and I'm like, Ugh. and then I felt this like utter relief of the judge when he spoke and it was like, oh my God. So he saw through this too, thank God, you know? <laughs> so anyways, and guess what? That's what we're talking about in today's video. So the way we're going to do it is I'm going to be putting up different clips and we're going to kind of cover from start to finish of it. Now, what I've done is just picked out some highlights to talk about to use as talking points. Uh, and we're going to spend a lot of the focus towards the end on what the judge says and what Lori says, because that part, y'all... I'm still floored, okay? I'm still absolutely floored. But before we get to that, I do want to listen to some of the impact statements, uh, some of the you know uh, the highlights, if you will. This is a sentencing that I highly implore you to go watch from start to finish. Uh, whether you follow the case from the beginning, or whether you you know dabble in you know watching this type of you know true crime content or whatever, because this has gone on for so long, it had so many different victims and so many different levels of victimization. And the survivors, the victims, they've all been through so much in this case. I, I can't even put it into words, right? And so to hear them be able to speak their piece and just to kind of hear it unfold in the sentencing day and bring it all to not an end because it's really the beginning of a part of the journey, right? We still have Chad. We still have other charges against Lori and whatnot. So anyways, I'll quit talking now. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start off with a couple of the clips, like I said, from the... Um, from the victim impact statements and what we'll do is i'll use those as a talking point just to make some commentary that type of stuff so anyways let's go ahead and watch that first clip or what had been the plan for quite some time unbeknownst to her there had been quite a bit of discussion about how to get rid of the obstacles that Lori had Lori had already killed two of her children tammy was next on her list of obstacle removal Lori wanted money, sex, and more power, and what Lori wants, Lori gets. The plan was in place on how to get it. Instead of a good night's sleep, Tammy was brutally executed in her own bed. Now, who we're hearing from right now is Tammy Daybell's sister, and we're also hearing her talk about a variety of the victims. She doesn't just focus on her sister in this. And, you know, one thing that I liked about this clip that I put it up here is because she calls it out, and that was one thing to hear, you know, Kay, her, these different impact statements that were read, is them just calling Lori out for what she is and she just has to sit there and I'm sure she was going blah 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 in her mind right but just like in here where she says you know what Lori gets the Lori what Lori wants she gets type thing because that's what we saw in this case the evidence presented that no matter how much Lori tries to gaslight her religious stuff and all that onto this there's a core basis here but also another thing I wanted to put this up here to hear some of the the moments of Tammy it's because of the things that Lori will say about Tammy and her speech or whatever you call it, her addressing the court, that I was just like, are you kidding me? Because this right here, what we just heard, this is the real Lori. We can see through the evidence how Lori felt about Tammy, right? So when she comes up with this stuff talking about she's my friend and all this type of stuff, I was like, what? What? I mean, how are we going to arrive here, right? So let's move on to the next clip. 
Never will she whisper a joke with a friend and laugh. Never see another sunrise or a sunset. Now, these moments, these little moments of life, like she describes, you know, never seen a grandchildren, never seen the sunset, these type things. These are the heavy moments. These are what make this, I mean, it gives me goosebumps, real for us who might not have known Tammy personally or, you know, J.J. Tiley, any of the victims in this case, right, Charles? Um, and so hearing these little, you know, nuggets, if you will, of the victims' lives and stuff like that and all the things that they're going to miss because at the end of the day, while Lori sits over her little table smirking, thinking of whatever she's going to say later, this is the reality. Tammy's life was stolen. Lori had part in that. I mean, it's just, it is what it is, right? She can try and talk her way out of it. Um, you know, but hearing these moments also make it more real to be like, my God, just imagining losing your child, your brother, your sister, your mother, all, all the different things that each of these victims, you know, were to different people, you know, and they go on always wondering, you know, what would JJ and Tylee be like later? What would Tammy have, you know, been like to have met all of her children, you know, the, the future moments and grandchildren and all this type of stuff, right? Uh, we'll be forever wondering those things. So I wanted to include that for that reason. The next uh, victim will be Kay Woodcock. All right, Miss Woodcock. Now, as you heard them just say, Kay Woodcock is now going to speak. And, whew, you know, my hat's off to everybody who got up there and said their piece because I don't think, I, I, I don't, I would like to think that I could do it if I had to, but it takes a huge amount of bravery and, um, like, strength to be able to get up there and do this, you know, because this is so emotional. I feel like if it was me, I would be so over flooded with emotion that I would have, like, a moment. And what I mean by a moment is I don't really know. Like, I would pass out something, right? So my hat is off to them. So let's listen to some of the highlights of what Kay had to say. Her appreciation and thanks can never be expressed in a way that will ad adequately or effectively convey our gratitude. Today marks 1,481 days that have been filled with terror. One was the day my brother Charles was murdered. Now, I wanted to include this here for those of you who might not have watched the entire thing. What Kay did is she outlined all these different numbers in the very beginning, and she just was reading them off, and she's like, these will become, you're going to understand this here in a minute. And so this is, you heard her 1,084 days or whatever number she just uh, said back. And so she went through this whole list of this. It was so poetic. Again, goosebumps. I'm going to have goosebumps all throughout. My face is going numb with like whatever that feeling is, right? Um so poetic so powerful so well thought out and it had so much emphasis at least for me right um watching it at home and i can only imagine for the courtroom as well uh, so let's continue i now realize what a nothing chad daybell is a man with no ability to support anyone no success of his own a user of the weak-minded, a lazy, good-for-nothing, spineless man that rode his wife's coattails of success. I mean, sing it loud, sing it proud, girl, okay? I absolutely loved this right here because did she not nail Chad to a T, right? I mean, this is Chad, right? Now, if you read any of his books, or especially the one where he talks about his life as a... Um, Again, a sexton, the the dude who does the cemetery stuff. We read it here on the channel a long time ago. I mean, literally, Kay just summed him up, right? You could get that from that book right there, but we also see it from here. He was a spineless twerp, okay? And I'm, you know, I don't know, I'm being nice with those words. Um, look at what came of his cowardness. And really, he was just using everyone. And that's the thing that's frustrated me so much with his case is the fact that all of this is going on. And the evidence speaks to this very obvious thing. Money motivation, 
Chad being this way, Lori being this way, but they try and hide behind these smirks and like this religious narcissism or something, right? Like this better than thou something, right? You know, just something, I don't know what. Um, and it's so infuriating. Oh my God, it's so infuriating to know the things that they did and to try and just wipe it away with this smarmy thing of, I know who the real God is and Jesus and all this stuff. Oh my God. Because the reality is, like Kay just said, that is the reality. That is Chad. Nothing less, nothing more. This all began with greed. The greed for and desire for a $1 million life insurance policy. She should have answered my calls. She should have spoken to me. I would have given her the money. She could have let JJ entirely live and had a million dollars. She could have been free to be Chad's mistress and foot the bill with the money from spilled blood. Oh, yeah. Sing it loud, sing it proud, girl. And that's the thing that's also frustrating about this is just what she said. She's like, I would have given you the money. I would have given you the money, right? You could have gone and taken your little million dollars because that's apparently was the price tag that was worth a lot of people's lives in her and probably less than that, right, for Lori to take out all her, her own flesh and blood, right? You could have gone and done all this stuff. It, it It's so excruciating, but no, she couldn't do that because I also do believe she was getting back at others in K in, in a certain way, right? Like in, in Lori's little demented way. Now, of course, she would never, and she, by she, I mean, Lori would never admit to that, right? She didn't admit to anything so far. Um, but when she's like, you would have been free to go and be his little mistress with your blood money. I mean, that's exactly what it was. It's exactly what it was. And I'm so glad that she called her out. I wish I could have been in the courtroom to hear Kay reading this and to just have seen Lori, right? Like her reaction. Because in my mind, I'm like, she was probably off in La La Land, but making mental note of all this at the same time. Because she might act like, oh, I'm, you know, I've done this and I'm this spiritual but this not but no 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 she pays attention to this she files it away in her little bitter you know file folder wherever it might lie in her not only was jj smart but he was also funny content healthy compassionate and and an empathetic child jj didn't show his empathy and compassion with hugs and kisses in fact you had to chase him down for those but instead with his gentle touch and speaking in soft tones, he would constantly stop to ask people if they were okay, if he could see or sense they were hurt. And I wanted to include this clip just to hear a little bit about JJ coming from Kay. And we've heard this all along. We've gotten to know the family, the victims, the children, everyone through the voices of the survivors who are speaking for them, who are now their voices, right? Uh, and it's so heartbreaking. It's so heartbreaking. And I'm sorry, I keep, I'm looking at my computer right here. So I haven't said that, but my computer is right here. That's why I keep looking this way and talking because I'm just looking at the footage and whatnot. Um, it's so heartbreaking though, to just you know hear these descriptions of these wonderful people and what they had to offer and what will be missed. You know, and when you get to the children who never had a chance to experience so many first, they were never given that chance. It was stolen from them at such a young, age and in such a horrifyingly brutal way. Lori's acts of depravity, cruelty, and betrayal have no limits. She murdered and stole JJ's daddy from him on July 11th, 2019. Next, she was trying to sell Bailey, JJ's adored and cherished service dog, his shadow and his best friend. <laughs> When caught, she was confronted and forced to give Bailey back to his original trainer. I mean, just like Kay said, there is no such thing as uh, is too low for Lori, right? That right there is grimy, okay? Grimy. This woman is pure evil, pure evil and in a human shape form, right? You know, and to hear Kay reading this, and again, I mean, I'll probably say it a hundred times in this video, you know, to get up there and be able to go through this and keep it together as much as she did, because I'm, I'm almost a little bit of a mess over here right now, right? And this is just like going back through this stuff. I mean, it just sends chills all over me, you know, and then just the realization when I'm sitting here, I'm like, God knows, no one, to, for her and Larry and all the other survivors went out to be going through this in life, 
who does nobody deserves that you know what i'm saying and obviously nobody deserves to lose their life either um but it's just this this shows you the level and the depths of pain and hurt and trauma that Lori and chad have caused to so many people Lori is undeniably a monster a monster that has taken away taken any has not taken any responsibility or shown an ounce of remorse for her vile actions she deserves to never again breathe oxygen as a free member of society. Her actions, dismissive behavior, and disinterest in court proceedings continue to validate her lack of accountability and remorse or any possibility to be rehabilitated. Again, amen, girl. Sing it loud, sing it proud. This is when I was watching this at first, I was way more animated about it because, you know, Kay so eloquently has just summed Lori up and Chad and everybody as well as, the, the, you know, Tammy's sister and whatnot did as well. Um, and, and again, there is no rehabilitation for this, right? You, you don't come back from this, okay? And, you know, for her to, and for Kay to sit here and read this out, like, look, you know what? And she's covering all the bases because it's all like salt in the wound, at least from my viewpoint of watching this play out. You know, all the way from that first smarmy smirk that uh, Lori shot to Kay when this was all first going down. I think they were even in Hawaii, maybe. I can't remember where they were at when they, she was being paraded in court. And she just had this like little condescending look. It was so disgusting. And then to not participate in any of this and just kind of like wipe it away, which I personally think is a way that Lori tries to, in her world, retain control maybe over this. I don't know. I'm not a doctor, a lawyer, and none of that fancy stuff, right? Uh, I mean, this, so this is just kind of how I view it. There might be like a, a logical diagnosis to go along with this behavior, right? I don't know. But it's just how it seems to me at least. Uh, so let's move on to the next clip. Lori Cox Daybell is a danger to society. Her body and manipulative mind are weapons used for her selfish greed and satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Again, she just calls it out, calls it like we see it. Yeah, because that's one thing that we, uh, and we just, you know, the community, the true crime community, whatever, has commented on, it seems through this, is Lori's manipulative behavior and almost like uh, using uh, her you know, her sexual prowess and that type of stuff is a currency to, you know, get what she wants type thing. Yeah, you know, because from what I've seen too with Chad, I mean, Chad was smitten. Like to him, this was just, you know, it was his goddess. Like he said, in his cheesy writings, you know, this is his goddess. And I think Lori knew how to play that. I think she knew how to play a certain vibe to get what she wanted, especially out of men now also if you look at and go back if you've watched uh you know in your mental rolodex here or whatever index um when Lori was doing those interviews and it was uh i believe a female officer she very quickly knows how to change gears and go into that right it doesn't just have to be a male she knows how to pander to another female she knows how to pander to the men it's what she does it just seems to be second nature to her and finally the number one for the defendant, the person that will never matter again once we walk out the door. I absolutely loved the Kay included in this. As the kids might say, she she ate and left no crumbs with this one, okay? I love that, because it's so true, right? Because so many times we see in these cases, Think Daryl Brooks, think Scott Nelson. You know, these people who make this mockery in the courtroom, right? Now, Lori's done it, but not in that same type Daryl Brooksy type way, right? Because she really hasn't said anything, but it's just been like this facial expressions, lack of concern, this type thing. Not wanting to be in the courtroom to look at the pictures when they're put up, this type stuff. You know, so the charade that they're put on, and I can guarantee you Lori loves this attention. I mean, we've seen her all dolled up with her hair and whatnot, right? You know, coming and going to court and being in court and whatnot. So she loves this attention. But she will go into the Netherlands. The only thing, not the Netherlands, you know, say the Neverworld or whatever you want to call it. Uh, she's going to go into the Forgotten Realm because life will and i don't want to say move on because there's victims in this that you know life doesn't move on for the families and them but this spotlight that's been on lori will dissipate move on it will people will move on from that right now we're still going to see other cases come up with her and whatnot but justice has been served in these cases right here right as best as it possibly could at least and so that's it right you know people heal 
they piece back together life the best they can, right? I mean, how, you know, in whatever way that might look like for each person, uh, there's so many pieces to pick up from something this horrifying, right? Um, but I absolutely love that Kate put that because that is a sucker punch to Lori. Because to somebody like Lori, any attention is good attention, right? I mean, this is what it seems like to me at least. And so to go into the realm of forgottenness is probably one of our worst nightmares. Now, what we're going to watch next is Rob Wood. He's going to be reading Colby Ryan's statement. So just know that that's why he's the one standing up reading this. And so let's go ahead with the first clip here. As the older brother to Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, and the son of Charles Vallow, I want to say the generations have been affected by these murders. My children will never know their uncle, their aunt, or grandfather, or even their own grandmother. Tylee and J.J. brought so much light into this world. With their lives being stolen, I would like to share this. I believe that nothing could or will ever be the same. Tylee will never have an opportunity to become a mother, wife, or have the career she was destined to have. She will never be able to have the life she deserved. JJ will never be able to grow and spread his light with this world the way he did. I thought, again, these were very beautiful words. Uh, and so very true, and like we've heard echoed throughout the other victim impact statements of, you know, so many whys, so many what could have been, so many what would they have been like type thing. And then also I like that Kobe did mention the depths that this fractures, not only with the loss of the loved one, right? But it goes down the line. Look at all the different stuff we've seen come out with this, you know, and the different thing. It's just been, it's crazy, right? Gener this this trauma goes for generations and generations. I mean, this is so major, and especially this case. I mean, this. I mean, it was like the world to stop for a minute. It was like what? I mean, it was so horrible, right? It is so horrible. So you have that added thing on it. You know, oftentimes we see these crimes take place maybe locally or within our own family or communities that don't get this national huge coverage, but the loss is still the same. It's still just as powerful. Um, so I thought these were beautiful words and sentiments that he had included in on his statement. This has affected me personally more than I could ever possibly put into words. I've lost my entire family in life. I lost the opportunity to share life with the people I love the most. I've watched everything crumble and be shredded to pieces. And this is what I'm talking about, this type thing here. I mean, what, I mean, what do you do, right? I mean, look at the devastation that this causes to those still left behind. You know, the fractured families, the fractured lives, that type of thing. And I... Again, I would have loved to have seen what she was doing during this part right here, like up close, right? Um, because, you know, she sits here and wants to say how much she loves her children, this, that, and the other, which is a complete lie, in my opinion. You know, and I understand that, you know, at some point, you know, everyone was saying she was a good mother at some point in this type of thing. Okay, I get that. I don't doubt that, okay? You know, I'm sure she probably was, although I have a hard time imagining it, right? But I mean, I wasn't there. I don't know these people, so I go on what other people say, you know? And so whatever happened along the way, whatever just unlocked this part of Lori, you know, that became this monster that's been lying in wait or whatever, you know, and this monster destroyed every facet of the family. Some literally were taking the lives, you know, and others, you know, just destroying lives down to this point of, you know, your own son sitting here saying these things to you, you know, or writing them down at least or whatever, you know what I mean? Um, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, so let's continue with some other clips of this. Now let's switch gears here for a minute. And I want to focus on what the defense had to say. And this is during like the recommendations for sentencing and whatnot. Uh, because when I started listening to this, I was like, am I in an alternate reality? Now I want to say this. I, everyone deserves their day in court and a fair defense and trial. 100% stand by that. I understand that they are doing their job, right? When I start hearing what he is getting ready to say and we're going to review, I was like, oh, whoa. Literally nothing to work with, okay? I mean, we're really scraping the bottom of the barrel. So it just goes to show me where I'm like, oh, yeah, she has just been heels in the sand this whole time, right? And not giving them one little thing to be able to even work with with this case. So that being said, let's go ahead and listen to this first clip. And 
the message that I think I need to tell the court and the recommendation that I need to give to the court regarding Ms. Vallow is a message of peace and love and joy and hope. Excuse me, what? That's literally the look on my face. I was like, what? I was like, you could have heard a pin drop in that courtroom when he said, peace, love, and hope. I was like, no, please, no, no. Please tell me we're not getting ready to get on this path. And we went down it all right. Let's listen to some more. That Lori Daybell is probably the most hated woman in America right now. And maybe in the world. But that hate will never bring closure to the victims. That hate will never bring about the healing to those who are hurt by this case, this case. And hate will never bring about peace. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Okay, now on this one right here, and this is just how I personally felt, right? So when I was listening to this, I was like, I feel like I'm being chastised. I feel like I'm being lectured to. Take the temperature of the room. No. It almost felt like Lori wrote this for him, right? You know what I'm saying? I was like, you know, like this, like taking the high road, like, let's not, you know, let's not let's combat this with peace and love. You know, Martin Luther King even said this over here. And I'm like, oh, no absolutely not i was the whole time i was like I, I was like if i was in that courtroom i would have just been like looking at some of the survivors and been like what are they thinking yeah you know, because this i was like this is like salt in the wound now i could be, i mean and if nobody else got that from it i mean okay cool right um it's just me being salty or bitter you know what i'm saying but i was just like i i was literally my mouth was on the ground but this was the precursor to what Lori had to say, okay? And that took the cake. And Lori, if she could speak to each one of those people who have been hurt by this case or been affected by this case in an active way, her message would be one of love. Her motto is, love is the key. That part right there had me almost punching through the television. She did speak to people in this we heard some of the phone calls right this was not her message right she just doubled down on everything we've never heard her say a genuine i'm sorry and this is even to her own family members right before you even get into you know of course we're never going to hear her say that to Kay or anyone like that Lori's not capable of that right um <laughs> You know, but like, Lori's message is, you know, love is the love and all that. And I'm like, uh, are you kidding? It, honestly, I wonder if she made him say this. It li The more I think about it, I'm like, it literally sounds like something that she wrote. You know, from third person. I could completely see her doing that. And be like, no, I want you to read this. I want you to read it. You know. It, oh my gosh. It, it literally just paralyzes me with anger. I mean, it really y'all. I just could not believe what I was hearing for this. So let's listen to a couple more clips of it and then we'll get to what she had to say. Hey, Woodcock, saying her praises today, that, that Lori was a great mom and that Kay allowed JJ Kanan to be adopted by, uh, by Lori and, and Charles. I mean, again, this is a lesson and less is more. You know, saying after after Kay got up and said all this stuff, and then he sits here and says, "Well, Kay even said that she was a good mom." We this is nothing. We get this, like I said earlier. People who've known Lori like this whole span of time will will attest to she was Miss you know Miss Super Mom. She did this, she did that, so on and so forth. You know, and so that's you know I, I understand that. This is less is more. You're going, you're throwing yourself at the court almost, right? In this scenario, uh, we're going into sentencing. 
they obviously are going to ask for the lesser of the sentence, right? They're trying to, you know, help the client out, whatever. We'll get into that in a minute. You know, but sitting here and just doing anything at all to be like, well, one of the victims said this, you know, I'm just like, no, don't, don't do that. Like, absolutely don't. You don't have the right. You know, I mean, I guess that they have the right, obviously, I don't want to get into that. But you know what I'm saying? It feels like they shouldn't. It feels like they shouldn't be allowed to talk about it in that context. At least to me, maybe I'm just like getting too all up in it. I don't know. Let's go to the next clip. We saved her life. And that is a win. That's a win for all humanity. Okay, now this is one part here that I've always kind of felt along the way. When they were able to get the death penalty off the table for her, honestly, in this case right here, like you said, you know what? They did their job. They just saved her life. You know, for that side of the fence, anything else, what she ended up getting, we saved your life. You know what I mean? Um, but again, hearing the context of regardless of what you believe in when it comes down to death penalty, all that kind of stuff, right? Just taking all that aside, because I know it can go down that path of like that, and it's just taking all that aside. I guess I'm not wanting to hear from the defense about the value of, you know, oh, this is a win for all of humanity because we saved Lori's life. Because immediately it puts images of the true victims in this case. And maybe that's what I'm kind of talking myself to this. Maybe that's what irritates me about it is it's almost aligning her in this like victim stance. You know what I mean? Like that kind of level and it runs all over me, you know, because and again, she has her right to the defense. They have their right to speak their piece, right? I get that. You know, and we've seen, y'all, if you've been following these trials, we've seen defense lawyers get up there and just be absolutely next level, right? And so he's being very calm, very whatever, you know, but it's just, it's so raw, all of this. And again, this is coming from somebody who doesn't, you know, I mean, this this wasn't my family. I don't personally know these people, you know, but we've grown to care about them during this time and to get to know them. And then just when you learn the details of the crime, it's so horrifying that it's just, it's not anything that I'm wanting to hear her side of the fence try and make it look like she's any kind of a victim or this out of the other. It's just not the time or place, but you know, that's just my little opinion. We would ask the court to sentence Ms. Fellow Daybell to a 20 year fixed term with an indeterminate term of life, indeterminate term of life. We believe that that meets all of the goals of sentencing with an added bonus of hope. I'm not gonna lie, I damn near wanted to bust out laughing with that, with an added bonus of hope. That's what I'm talking about where I'm like, dude, I don't know who wrote this, of let's give the world hope by not sentencing her to a strict thing. I mean, seriously. But that's where I feel like they were trying to guilt us, you know, or the judge, you know what I'm saying? Like, let's let's go this route. Let's go moral high ground. Let's do that, you know. But again, it's their job. They are representing her and trying to do everything they possibly can for her. So I can respect that, you know what I'm saying? But again, just hearing it, I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. And hope, oh my God, I cannot roll my eyes hard enough, okay? Oh my God, you know, I'm just like in hope. Hope would be putting her under the jail, okay? You know what I'm saying? That That's gonna give us hope that we can stay protected from monsters like this, you know what I'm saying? So anyways, let's move on. It's for everyone who lives and breathes outside the walls of prison. Her hope will benefit society. In our opinion, if you give her fixed life, you will have essentially thrown her away. She has no incentive to rehabilitate. There is no deterrent to her or anyone else. You would have thrown her away like she did to her own children in the back of Chad's yard, buried out there like dogs in the pet cemetery. And you want to talk about throwing her away showing the society a lesson. No, okay? Absolutely not. I mean, 
that's where it's saying too much, right? This is where I'm just like, you're probably pissing the judge off. You know what I mean? Because if I feel this way, you know, they've seen stuff that we haven't seen. Like, you know what I'm saying? They've been there. They've, they, I mean, this is the judge. He's presided over the thing. He's seen the victims. He interacted with, you know, Kayla, all these people, right? To get up there and then talk about some moral high ground, I was like, that's ballsy. That is ballsy. Now, this one, y'all, Roscoe, get the damn seatbelt out, Roscoe. Roscoe's got the seatbelt over there. I'm not joking, y'all. Y'all need to buckle up for this one, okay? Roscoe, cover your ears and close your eyes because I don't think any little chihuahua needs to hear this stuff. We're getting ready to listen to Lori. When, and I give a shout out to Miss Emily, our moderator at this channel, our lovely Emily. When she was texting me saying that Lori, I was at work the whole day this was going on, she was like, Lori is speaking. You know, I was like, what? I mean, I was not expecting this. And when I watched this, y'all, when I tell you, I was like, Paul, you're going to throw the computer through the wall. The things that came after all this time, after all these years, and then this ridiculousness is what came out of her mouth. So I've warned you. Roll tape. I would like to start by quoting John from the New Testament in the Bible. In John chapter 8, verse 7, Jesus says, He that is without sin among you, let him cast first cast a stone at her. Then in first verse 15, Jesus says, Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. That first thing she said right there. First words out of her mouth is to chastise everybody. I was like, oh my God. I, I, I was, I mean, flabbergasted is the only word for it. I was like, after all this time, after all that's gone down, that's what you have to say. That's what you start off with. Literally displaying to the court that you have not changed, you have no self-reflection, you have no ability to change, no abilities for self-reflection, none of this. You are right back, you might as well be right back there on the beach in Hawaii with Chad dancing while your children are in his backyard. True. Jesus knows me. And Jesus understands me. I mourn with all of you who mourn my children and tammy immediately makes herself out to be the victim of fake cries jesus knows me i mourn with all of you seriously seriously and, and again the judge had to be sitting there just like rolling it like oh my god are you kidding me i mean because like he did a good job just being like this here's a judge Right, just like, you know, not even showing any emotion, which is what they're supposed to do, right? I mean, can you imagine me if I was up there? There's no way. They would fire me on the first day. First day, first case, they'd be like, it'd be a traffic ticket. They'd fire me. <laughs> they'd be like, you can't do this, Paul. Um, but he did an excellent job of that, right? Because literally, this is the first few seconds of what she had to say. And it's like, after all this, after blood, or not blood, sweat, and tears, but after the, the tearful testimony and victim impact statements, you're going to say this, you know, okay, let's continue. Jesus Christ knows the truth of what happened here. Jesus Christ knows that no one was murdered in this case. Accidental deaths happen. Suicides happen. Fatal side effects from medications happen. The fact that she then tries to insinuate that these were the methods that all this took place. I'm like, girl, I don't know what they're putting in the juice there at, at jail or in county, wherever you are, but it must be good. Oh, these things happen, you know, A, B, and C happens all around you in the short amount of time that you just conveniently benefit financially from with your little loser boyfriend, Chad. No, we ain't buying it at all. Happen. I have a different perspective in life because in 2002, when I was pregnant with Tylee, I died in the hospital while in labor with her. They tried to stop my labor. 
they put me on the table and they put something in my IV and I felt my spirit falling to the floor. You know, did you see the judge a little bit? Now, I'm not trying to say that he was doing anything, but he did this number. He was like, there had to have been like an audible sigh in the whole courtroom over this when it was just like, really, we're, we're right here again. You're using your platform to go off on how, you know, you have this like super secret religious, you know, access to Jesus Christ. You know what I'm saying? Where I'm just like, why, why do they always do this? And by they, I mean the Lorries, the Leticias, the Scott Nelsons, the Daryl Brooks. Why do we always end up here with them where it's like the most attention they've ever gotten and they're going to use it to try and victimize themselves and display their belief system that like nobody else is buying? I was standing near my pregnant body, watching the doctors try to revive me, which took them a few minutes. In that time, my sister Stacy was standing to my left. I turned to hug her and was surprised that her spirit was as tangible as a physical body because I knew I was in spirit and she was in spirit. She said she needed to show me some things and we went to heaven. Now, another thing that irritates me with this crowd, and by this crowd, I mean Lori, Chad, the whole, you know, little shebang, is this whole thing of, and we went to heaven. They try and, like, gatekeep this knowledge, like they have direct access or are actually some of these things they talk about, you know, so that they have, like, the knowledge, like, we have the scrolls we've come back with, you know, type thing or whatever. And so all throughout this, I've heard, you know, listening to the different testimony, whether it be in this trial or beforehand and whatnot, where it's this extreme need to be like, I've had an experience, it's given me information and whatever that makes me better than or have more knowledge or be more spiritual or whatever. Now, they're not using the words better than and all this type of stuff. It's just like underlying condescending thing. And the fact that she's using this moment to continue on with it is revolting. You went to heaven. I later returned to my body. Because of this experience, I have access to heaven and the spirit world. Since then, I have had many communications from people now living in heaven, including my children, Tylee Ashland and Joshua Jackson, my sisters, Stacy and Lolly, my aunts and my uncles and my grandparents. So see, this is exactly what I'm talking about this because I've gone there. I have direct access to these you know, people who are in heaven. I'm able to talk to them, you know, so I have this information. You don't. The fact that she's sitting here saying my children and using their full names, knowing what happened absolutely runs all over me, right? And again, we'll hear in a moment, you know, the judge ain't buying any of this. He sees right through this. Grandparents, I have had many communications with Jesus Christ, the savior of this world, and our heavenly parents. I've had many angelic visitors have come and communicated with me and even manifested themselves to me. Because of these communications, I know for a fact that my children are happy and busy in the spirit world. Now, again, that last part, because of these communications, I know for a fact that they're happy and busy. How dare she? How dare she? But again, you heard all throughout this. I have this knowledge. I have this direct access. You know, and because of this, it's nothing that you can prove, of course, right? I mean, we, we don't want to do anything like that. You know, but it's just the stuff that I'm like, honey, no, girl, absolutely not, right? People don't buy this, okay? And just like Kay said earlier about Chad praying on the feeble-minded, this is what we're talking about right here, okay? Because I think Lori did the same thing, and I think she is also one of those, of peddling this dribble to whoever will listen, right? You know, and having these, like, almost like these standoffs of who, you know, who's more spiritual with these, you know, this cast of characters we've seen throughout. And it just runs all over me. But now when she gets into trying to justify and speak for 
Tammy and JJ and Tylee and Charles and countless other people, right? I just, it, it, it leaves me baffled. And I want to say it leaves me shocked and surprised, but at this point we've seen her behavior. But I guess it still does because I would have expected something. And that something could have been her not saying a word, right? It's almost worse that she has said this because I do think that this is the last little let me rub the salt in the wound, let me spit on their grave. Spirit world. Because of my communications with my friend Tammy Daybell, I know that she is also very happy and extremely busy. I have always mourned the loss of my loved ones, and I have lost many in this mortal world. Now that part right there where she says my friend Tammy is happy and this, that, and the other, how dare she even say that? I cannot believe that she said that. This is, and the judge will say this, evidence shows she, uh, Lori was planning on marrying Tammy's husband while she was still alive, making all these plans for this. We've seen the evidence. So for her to even use the words of Tammy's name in the same sentence with friend is so disrespectful to me. I was like, I cannot. And now notice at the end of that where she's like, and I have lost many. This whole thing, I am a victim, feel sorry for me. It's this go-to thing and this little feeble voice that she's using throughout, right? I think it's a complete act. Mortal world. However, I know that more than most people, I know where they are now and what they're doing. I know how wonderful heaven is, and I'm homesick for it every single day. I know we all lived in heaven before we were born on earth, and we were all adult spirits in the heavenly realm. We chose to come to earth as mortals. This whole thing of I'm homesick for it and all that, she still has other cases to go to, right? She might be getting a one-way ticket back to heaven real soon. Also, how interesting that it's like she's trying to take ownership of like the whole power that she could be perceiving that the public and these, you know, the people, the victims, the people of the court system, whatever you want to call it, has this power of potentially being able to take her life away and tell her what to do and all this. So it's almost like all she can cling to is like backing away and being like, I live in the spirit world. And you can't control that. You don't have power over that. You know, and I don't know, that might not make sense. It might sound confusing because, well, it kind of does to me too. I don't really know how to word that. But it just feels like that. Like she's trying to retain power over having no power anymore. You know, almost like the sour grapes type thing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so let's continue. Mortals, heaven is more wonderful than you can possibly imagine. I do not fear death, but I look forward to it. I do not, I did not want to return to my body when I was out of it. Even though my son Colby, who I adored more than anything, was only six years old at the time, and I was about to give birth to this new baby girl that I wanted so badly. I mean, what does she want? Like a slow clap from the audience for coming back? I mean, it's this whole thing of get off the cross, honey. We need the firewood, right? It's like, and, and that she's still of this frame of mind is so telling because when you get into like somebody rehabilitative, this, that, and the other, it's like, well, the proof is in the pudding, right? I mean, listen to her. She's telling us flashing signs. I will never change. I will never change. The years later, after all this, I am still spouting this nonsense. This is who I am. This is who I will always be. I wanted so badly. I was a young mother, and you would think I wouldn't want to leave my children, but as I stood in heaven, I did not want to go back. I thought they would be fine. Well, she's also proved that point because she didn't want to take care of them you know, for the last several years, and we see what she was okay with having done to them, right, and participating in that. So this right here, I'm just like, no, you're not going to get accolades from us you know, for coming back and you know, allegedly, right? That's if you're going down the, the whole realm of believing this story that she's telling the courtroom at this point. I'll bet you, you could hear people's eyes actively roll into the back of their heads in there. But then I was told by Jesus 
that I needed to go back and complete things that I had covenanted or promised to do before I was born. This caused me a lot of distress because I knew heaven was my real home and I only wanted to be there. I was free from pain, emotional and physical. But then I was shown how I would help my children and others in the future. So ultimately, I did agree to go back to my body. Now, this part right here where she's talking about, I saw how I was going to help my children and others. I mean, again, I'm just like, did your lawyers look at this? I mean, I'm sure if they did, she was going to read it anyways, right? Like, she just seems like that type person. You know, but again, it's this whole thing of like, I agreed to come back. I had this special mission. It's like, that's the only way she, Chad, this whole little crowd seems to be able to feel special is by claiming these outrageous, fantastical things that they are the only ones meant for, you know, whatever, the second coming, whatever you want to call it, right? and but to get up here and use this moment for that it just it blows my mind and to just say these insensitive things you know to ultimately help my children i mean because I, i'll guarantee you Lori looks at what if you could get in her head in those moments like where she puts her head down on a pillow and there's nothing else around but your thoughts she knows what happened and she probably justifies it in her mind by this stuff right here by being like, no, you know, Tylee was in a lot of pain. I helped her. That was like my life mission, that type thing, right? Um, I think that she completely has justified all of this in her mind, but she's also twisting it for the courtroom theatrics that she's putting on. Tylee has visited me. She is happy and very busy. Tylee is free now from all the pains of her life. Tylee suffered horrible physical pain her whole life. I sat with Tylee in the hospital year after year after year while she screamed in pain when the morphine wasn't even enough to take away the pain of her pancreatitis. And this is what I'm talking about. Number one, talking about all this pain Tylee was in, oh, this, that, and the other, like she was doing her a favor by doing what happened, right? But then secondly, notice Lori can't say something like that about someone else without wrapping herself in there. I said in the emergency room year after year, these personality types always tell on themselves, right? Because they can't help but gloat. They can't help but brag. They can't help but be a victim. They can't help but project. They can't help but lie. Pancreatitis. I sat there while she cried and I held back her hair while she threw up. And I am the only person on this earth who knows how much Tylee suffered in her life. She had pain every single day. She never felt good. Her body did not work right. And I don't know if that was from complications from me dying while she was being born or something else, but she had a very difficult life. Again, you know, the whole thing, how much pain Tally was in, how much this and that, oh, this miserable. She's the way she's describing her. You would never expect to see pictures of a smiling, laughing girl like we've seen at all. Right. And again, notice how Lori has to throw in there. I don't know if those were complications for me dying while she was in birth, while I was giving birth. You know, again, can't help but turn it around to herself. I fought for her in court. I protected her. I tried to protect her with my whole life. I tried to protect her. I worried about her every single day. Tylee had to get her GED because she couldn't go to school every day because she never felt good. She felt sick. Nobody knows this because Tylee, like myself, tries to put on a good front. Once again, just very quickly, the very last words there. Nobody would know this about Tylee because, like myself, she tries to put up a good front. She cannot even just... Even in Tylee's death, she can't give her one thing, right? She has to include herself in on it. On any attention that might be garnered, she's going to have to take away from that as well. Blows my mind. One of the times that Tylee came to me as a spirit after she died, she said, she commanded me and she said to me, stop worrying, mom. We are fine. She knows how I worry and how I miss her. I find that incredibly hard to believe, right? 
First of all, I don't even believe that she's had any of these conversations. I think she's making this stuff up, right? Or she's just something. I don't know what. You know, but again, to sit here and just try and pivot this, I, I that's why I just think it's a lie. I think that she's trying to justify it. And that in her world, maybe she still thinks that people believe this stuff, right? Even after all this. And maybe this is all she has to cling to. Now, one thing that, you know, has gone on throughout this whole th trial and whatnot is Lori... If Lori were to ever sit here and say, you know what, what I believe wasn't real, what I believe wasn't this or that, then all of the reasonings and justifications for what she did and participated in would fall beneath her. And it would be this just left for what it is, a murderous event, right? So I think she's going to always have to go with some level of BS in order to justify what happened or else she'll just, there's no other, you, you can't deny it then. It's like, I'm just a murderous, you know, villain, right? But with all these other things, she's able to, um, you know, make believe, if you will, right? I don't know the, I don't know the psychological term. You know, I feel like cognitive dissonance, but again, I don't know, right? These are just kind of buzzwords or whatever, but you, you get where I'm going. So it's like she has to cling to this false belief, right? Or else all that's left is just how horrible of a person she is. The first time JJ visited me after he passed away, he put his arm around me and he said to me, you didn't do anything wrong, mom. I love you. And I know you loved me every minute of my life. But she was so eager to get rid of him once Chad came in the picture. You know, and sitting here saying, using the words mom, you know, at this point in the game, right? I wonder what Larry and Kay were doing during this moment right here. I mean, I feel so bad that if they were still in there, that they had to hear this, right? Because it's insulting to me. And I mean, again, like I've said, I mean, this is not, you know, my personal family. You know, I'm not close with these people, but you still feel that. So I can only fathom what it would feel like as someone who was the, the family members, the friends, the loved ones, you know, the survivors, this type thing, you know, what an insult that might feel like, because just to hear her say this, I'm like, girl, like, are you kidding me? He's getting up here and saying you did nothing wrong. I mean, it, she is trying so hard to convince maybe herself, right, that she's done nothing wrong because uh, clearly she failed to convince the jury and the judge. My eternal friend, Tammy Daybell, has visited me on several occasions. She came to bring me peace and comfort, and I know that she is extremely busy helping her family, especially her children and grandchildren, and I have a great love for Tammy. Again, can't roll my damn eyes hard enough. I have a great love for her. You were trying to marry her man on the side. You were having an affair with her husband. And you want to get up here and say you have a great love for her? And this whole thing about how everybody's busy. Everybody's very busy. Everybody's very busy. You know, and it's just like, I mean... W w Okay, you know, I mean, what is this proven? What is this, like, why do you keep saying that? You know, it's just sickening. We're lucky her speech wasn't as long, like, as, you know, some other situations have gone on, right? But it was still long. You could tell she put work into this, right? She put work into it. And she tried to cover all her bases to sit here and, like, honestly take ownership, not ownership, I shouldn't say that, take power away from others and also almost, like, have the last say. It feels like that, like, I'm getting the last word in, that type thing. My beautiful children... Tylee Ashland and Joshua Jackson rest safely this day in the arms of Jesus. <laughs> My wonderful friend, Tammy Daybell, rests safely this day in the arms of Jesus. And I look forward to the day when we are all reunited and I too will rest with them in the arms of my Jesus. The whole time I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, honey, I don't think you're going to the same place these people are, right? <laughs> She's very confident on that right there. I'm like, girl, I mean, maybe no one's informed you or whatever, but I, I don't think you're going to be going to the same place they are, okay? I mean, to also align that, to even look at, if you want to go just the spiritual way, where I'm like, you know, to sit here and participate and be a causation of these horrible events that took place, and then to sit here and try to be like, well, I went and visited them, and they're fine. They're not mad at me at all. I'm going to be reunited with them one day. I'm just like... I mean, the entitledness of it is just a.
astounding, okay? Now let's switch gears and let's listen to what the judge has to say about all this. Having considered all of the evidence that I saw at trial along with the jurors, it's been a difficult task for me to narrow down and articulate all of the aggravating factors because really there are so many here. Murder is the most serious offense. And the most unimaginable type of murder is to have a mother murdering her own children. And that's exactly what you did. Now, with these first things coming out of his mouth, I was like, sing it, brother. Sing it, brother. Go on. Because, again, we've, we've, he's been very, and he even still is very even kill throughout his speech, right? Or his, you know, words, whatever you want to call it, sentencing. But throughout this whole trial, right, he's been this way. And so he keeps it, you know, almost like very Dr. Grande. If you watch Dr. Grande, like how he's just very, here, I'm stating this information and that kind of thing. And he judge, the judge does remain that way through this, which I appreciate. But hearing what he has to say is so validating to know, oh, thank God, you know, he's calling her out too, right? You know, and just calling it what it is. You murdered your children. We're not getting into the spiritual stuff about you did Tylee a favor, you know, and JJ's not mad at you, and your best friend in the world is Tammy. I mean, come on, right? You know, you murdered your children and other people, okay? Let's not dress this up for anything less or more. You were involved in and guilty of conspiring to murder another group of children's mother, Tammy Daybell, who had children of her own. And despite the jury convicting you with overwhelming evidence, you still sit here before the court today and said you didn't do it. That part right there, when I tell you I was cheering him on, because we've been thinking this the whole time, right? Like I'm watching her speak, and I'm like, she's still, it gives me goosebumps, she's still denying it. So again, hearing the judge validate that, I was like, oh my God. Oh my God, I needed to hear that so badly. And I love that he also said, you conspired, or however he said it, to take another group of children's mother away. I like the, the way he worded that, you know, because it's also like, look, not only are you willing to go to the place of killing your own children, but you stole the life of another woman, another sister, another mother, right? How vile can you be? You came here to East Idaho, where I've spent my life and moved here from another place already with plans in progress to make your children disappear. The evidence bore that out at trial. You removed your children from their home in Arizona, alienated them from friends and family, got rid of JJ's service dog. You moved to Rexburg, a community where you could find a thousand random families to take your children and you brought them here to murder them. I mean, y'all, again, I have, I'm going to have goosebumps. My face is numb with, like, whatever you get when, like, you're getting, like, you know, emotional or whatever. Um, I, I just was like, and this is the second time. Like, I watched it one time all the way through and picked out the clips, obviously. So, clearly, this is my, like, second time watching this. But it affects me just the same. To hear him outline that and call this snake out for what she is. Because, again, just sitting here listening to this, like, I've always loved my children. And, you know, da -da 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 -da, and I was going to take care of them and do this for them and all that. And it's like, you brought them here with plans to kill them and get rid of them. You got rid of his service dog. Like you did A, B, C, and D. This was your plan. And that is what it, it, it is what it was, right? It is what it is. These were the plans. This is what the evidence shows. And she can deny it all she wants to, right? But the evidence is the evidence, okay? She was working towards this end goal. And she, whatever clicked in her mind of Chad and I are the leaders of the 144, whatever it was, she was done, right and then everyone became like this monetary thing to add to that plan and her lustful little chat adventure you know at the expense of their lives and it, it, so many other things you had so many other options you could have gotten divorced you could have found someone to take care of those kids but as the state was able to prove at trial you chose the most evil and destructive path possible you killed those children according to the state's theory, and I believe it, to remove them as obstacles and to profit financially. You justified all of this 
by going down a bizarre religious rabbit hole and clearly you are still down there. This part, oh my God, the fact that he called it this bizarre religious rabbit hole and clearly you're still there, thank God he said that, right? Because she is, right? I mean, it, this is like, honey, you're not even, re she gone. She gone, right? Now, also, I love that he brought up in the last clip we looked at in this one as well, of uh, there's a thousand families here that would have taken these children. You got Kay over there begging to get Jay. You know they would have taken Tylee in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat, they would have taken both these children. Begging to do so, okay? And just like he said, but instead, because that wouldn't, that would not serve Lori and Chad's ultimate plan, right? They needed, this was, this was, they're making a living off this, right? They can dress it up in the religious stuff, but follow the money. While you were enjoying your new life in Hawaii, countless law enforcement officers, family members, and volunteers were searching for your children. And I don't think to this day, you have any remorse for the effort and heartache you caused for others who looked for your children when you knew where they were and knew they were dead. And I 100% agree with him. She knew where they were. She knew they were dead. She's dancing on the beach in Hawaii with Chad. While the world is just all over the place, like where are these children, where are these children? I mean, I can remember when this happened and I remember, uh, God rest her soul, Denise talking about this and kind of explaining the case to us. And for those who don't follow me, Denise Rainey, she has a channel, it's linked down below. And she's kind of the one back then who introduced this case to me. Uh, she has since passed, but she was talking about all this and explaining it. This is the part where the authorities were like, you need to produce the children. Like in this amount of time, I can't remember what it was. And I remember talking to her and I said, I was like, you know what? They're either going to produce the children because that's what I thought. I was like, you know what? Maybe the kids have been hidden. That they, they got involved in this cult thing and she's hidden the children for their safety. I could not have been more wrong, right? And I was like, well, she's either going to produce them or this is going to be next level. And sadly, we obviously see where it went you know so the fact that he's also calling this out of you know looking back over the scheme of things and being like oh my god she knew exactly what happened and the fact that she's able to laugh and play a little ukulele on the beach with chad and all this kind of stuff makes it even more horrific after you knew they were dead you collected public funded assistance payments meant for them and that was blood money you kept for yourself. And that's the grand theft charge you've been convicted of. Again, follow the money. That's what I was talking about earlier. All of this is conveniently has all this monetary stuff following it, right? So this whole little charade that she's putting up with the religious stuff, you strip that away because that's just BS. That's all fake. This is about money, this is about lust, this is about greed, this is about her and Chad like ruling the world in some egomanical way. During the trial, when the evidence came out about how these children were found and the state they were in, you wanted to be excused and not have to watch the evidence and were fine to let all the other people in the courtroom, including the jurors, have to bear through that. However, I ruled that you did have to sit and watch and see the result of your heinous crimes. I love that he called her out on that BS right there because, again, it was just like she tried to play her little games that she's been playing because, yes, she doesn't want to see the outcome of her actions. And that's what's so pissy about it. And I love that he made her stay in there, right? Because it's like you, you, you signed up for this, right? You signed up for it. You know, how dare she want everyone else to have to suffer and see those horrible, horrible images? I can only imagine, right? The, the, uh, not just the family and all that, the, the, the rescue workers, the, the investigators, the judge, the courtroom, the jurors, everybody, right? But especially the family. I can't imagine seeing a loved one like that. I mean, especially children. I mean, my God, right? It's absolutely horrifying. And so I love that he's calling her out on all this stuff that we've seen along the way. Now, mind you, there's tons of it. So if he were to do that, we would this would have gone on for days. But he's hitting some major points and I'm like, thank God. He, you know, he was sitting here thinking the same thing we were. You know, you're gonna sit here and watch these images of what you're responsible for. And that's you're gonna that end of story. 
Tammy Daybell was murdered as a result of your conspiracy. She was by all accounts, a healthy, happy mother and wife through a lot of her life. And you were out shopping for wedding rings to marry her husband while she was still alive. You were planning a wedding to her husband while she was still alive. You haven't shown any remorse for any of those actions. And she ended up being murdered, buried, had to be disinterred later so an autopsy could be performed in order to prove the evidence of what you had done. She didn't deserve any of that. And again, hats off to him. She didn't deserve any of this. You know, all that had to go through with this, you know, taking the body back, all of this stuff. I mean, this is what we're talking about. Like, there's no low with this case. It just kept getting lower and lower and worse and worse. And then to sit here and hear her talking about my friend Tammy, I mean, no. Like, how dare you, right? It's even worse that way. It's just salt in the wound. And it is the most shocking thing, really, I can imagine, is that a mother killed her own children, and you simply have no remorse for it. Even sitting here today, there's no remorse for what you did. And like I said earlier, I don't think Lori is going to ever show remorse because to show remorse means to take responsibility, which clearly she's not going to do. But in this particular situation, you're taking responsibility for murdering your children, right? She ain't ever going to do that. I don't ever see that taking place with her. You may not believe to this day that you've done anything wrong and you still may think you're justified by your religious beliefs for what happened here. I'm not here to judge that, but I don't believe that any God in any religion would want to have, have this happen, what happened here. And thank God he said that, right? Because to sit here and you know be like, yeah, I'm not going to judge. But the fact that she's sitting here trying to wrap all this up in this religious context that, you know, everyone's okay with this and the spirit world, absolutely not. Now, let's move on to the actual sentencing and let's hear what the judge does. The charge you were convicted of, the, the first degree murder of Tylee Ryan, you are sentenced to the custody of the State Board of Corrections to serve the maximum allowed sentence of fixed determinate term of life imprisonment with no possibility of parole. On count four, the charge of the first degree murder of Joshua Jackson Vallow, you are sentenced to the custody of the State Board of Corrections to serve the maximum allowed sentence, a fixed determinate life imprisonment sentence with no possibility of parole. Now we're going to hear from these other things that he's sentencing as well. But again, thank God he has given her the max with this. I was hoping for it. Obviously, we didn't get the max, which is, you know, the death penalty. But with this, it's like the next best thing, right? The same serious sentence. So on count one, the conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Tylee Ryan and grand theft by deception. You're sentenced to the custody of the State Board of Corrections to serve the maximum allowed sentence to fixed determinate term of life imprisonment with no possibility of parole. And count three, the conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Joshua Jackson Vallow and grand theft by deception. You're sentenced to the custody of the State Board of Corrections to serve the maximum allowed sentence, a fixed determinate term of life imprisonment with no possibility of parole. And on count five, the conspiracy to commit the first degree murder of Tamara Tammy Daybell, you're sentenced to the custody of the State Board of Corrections to serve the maximum allowed sentence, a fixed determinate term of life imprisonment with no possibility of parole. Thank God for all that, right? I mean, my goodness, to hear him reel those words off, especially in comparison to having heard what the state was asking for and whatnot, and that the judge was like, absolutely not. I am sent, she's getting it all, right? She's getting it all. Finally, the court will address count seven, which is the charge of grand theft. On that charge, court is going to sentence you to a fixed determinate term of five years of prison, followed by an indeterminate term of five years of prison for a total 10 year term of imprisonment on the grand theft. I love that he also hit her with the grand theft. We ain't leaving no stone unturned on this. 
and you need to be held accountable separately for each of the three murders. So on those counts, the court will run consecutively the count two murder of Tylee Ryan, consecutive to count four, the murder of Joshua Jackson Vallow, and count five will run consecutive to count two and four, the conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Tamara Tammy Daybell. And I absolutely love that he stacked them on top of each other. It was so like monumental, I'm not sure if that's a word I'm looking for, or representative of the severity of it. And like he said, you know what, I want each of these crimes to serve each of its things, right? Because it does feel like a lot of times when they lump this all together, that it kind of like lessens it in a way. So I love that he stacked these on top. I mean, it really made me feel like he was giving her everything he possibly could. The court will impose fines as requested by the state in the amount of $25,000 for all counts except the grand theft. On the grand theft, the fine will be in the amount of $1,000. Take your damn honey buns, take your damn commissary, take it all away as far as I'm concerned. Now, here's the thing. Oh my gosh. I mean, it was this was such an emotional roller coaster. I'm not just talking about the sentencing. I mean, clearly that was because so much was on the line with the trial, but the entire case. It's been heartbreaking from day one and just otherworldly when the details of this crime came out. Now, remember, Lori's not done yet, right? She still has other charges facing her. So, sadly, we're probably going to be continuing to see more and more of her, right? I mean, she's going to be tied up in the legal system for years unless she pleads out or something like that, which I'm not sure if she would because she's going to be very bored. She talks about everybody being busy on the other side. She's not, she's going to have a lot of time on her hands right now it also makes me curious because remember the death penalty is still on the table for chad and seeing how this went down oh chatty boy should be shaking in his boots okay so let me know what you thought of the senate team what you thought of any aspect of it that you want to talk about or share in the comment section right now if you still are watching well i appreciate it i know this was a long one i'm sorry to have kept you so long roscoe apologizes as well he had to go take a nap a long time ago and and speaking of Roscoe, drop some sofas down in the comment sections for him. And until we meet down in the comment section to continue the conversation, I'll see y'all there.